Welcome to tonight's virtual in conversation program. My name is Chrissy McMillan and I'm the director of learning and engagement here at the Asheville Art Museum. We've all made a ton of changes over the past year. As most of you know, the museum shifted um, much of our program to programming to the virtual realm. While we've missed engaging with you in the galleries, a silver lining that has come from this time apart has been the opportunity to bring the museum to folks near and far from Asheville, Western North Carolina, across the state, country, and around the world, and to feature special guests that we might not have been able to in pre-COVID times. This chance opens up our ability to richly interpret the artwork in our collection and special exhibitions through a range of voices and points of view. We have evening in conversation programs planned each month that I'll mention to you at the end of this evening's program. This month, we're thrilled to welcome Stephen C. Wicks. Stephen curated our current special exhibition, Buford Delaney's Metamorphosis into Freedom, which is a stunning look at the work of this Knoxville, Tennessee native son. This exhibition was organized by the Knoxville Museum of Art, and a more expanded version was on view at the KMA last year. The Asheville Art Museum is the only stop for this traveling exhibition, and it's on view in our Explore Asheville Exhibition Hall through June 21st. This evening's program features an overview of Buford Delaney's Metamorphosis into Freedom and discussion of the KMA's role in scholarship, collecting, and exploring the legacy of this important artist. During the program, please add any questions or comments that you have to the chat box. We'll leave time at the end of the evening for Q&A. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome Hilary Schroeder, the museum's assistant curator and site curator of Buford Delaney's Metamorphosis into Freedom, to introduce our speaker. Hilary? Thank you, Christy. And um, we're excited to have Stephen here for this program and excited for this collaboration that we've had with the Knoxville Museum of Art. Um, we currently have work on view for just a little while longer from our Black Mountain collection, college collection in the exhibition, A Lasting Imprint. And now we have this wonderful work from the Knoxville Museum of Art here. So a little bit about Stephen. Um, Stephen is the Barbara W. and Bernard E. Bernstein Curator at the Knoxville Museum of Art. He has guided the KMA's curatorial department for more than 25 years. He manages the museum's exhibition programs and guides the development of its collection of East Tennessee related art and international contemporary art. He has been instrumental in helping the KMA build the world's largest and most comprehensive public collection of the Knoxville born painter Buford Delaney's art. And you'll hear more about that process tonight from him. He has organized dozens of exhibitions, including Buford Delaney and James Baldwin, Through the Unusual Door, Higher Ground, A Century of the Visual Arts in Tennessee, the first ongoing display devoted to East Tennessee's art history, Awakening Spirits, the Awakening the Spirits, the first ever retrospective devoted to the work of Bessie Harvey, who you may be familiar with from our collection hall here at the Asheville Art Museum. Um, facets of Modern and Contemporary Glass, which examined the expanding use of glass as a contemporary art material. Lift, Contemporary Printmaking in the Third Dimension, and New Dimensions in American Dra Directions in American Drawing. He previously served as curator of the collections and exhibitions at the Columbus Museum in Georgia, and is an active guest curator, juror, lecturer, and writer. He received his undergraduate degree in art history from the University of Tennessee, his graduate degree in art history and museum studies from Case Western Reserve University, and was awarded back-to-back -back Cleveland Museum of Art fellowships. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Wicks tonight. Good evening, everybody. I'm very glad to be with you. Christy, Hillary, thank you so much for the great job you've done with this exhibition, with the related programs. And I'm excited to be able to share with you a little bit of my journey uh, in the course of bringing Buford Delaney's legacy back to Knoxville and to the KMA. And it's so exciting to be able to share some of that legacy with the great uh, city that Asheville is and the great museum that you all have there. Um, I would like to begin by getting my controls all set. Uh, first of all, I'm going to switch to full screen mode. And then, are we looking good or do I need to make other adjustments? I'm still seeing you. Okay. I need to go back and... Not that we don't love to see you, but I think you want to show us your slides. 
Yes. All right, so one second here. Share screen. Here we go. Is that better? We've got the box in the lower right hand corner. And if you could just slide that down, perfect. And then uh, maybe you try this uh, hide floating meeting controls uh, on the far right hand of that button. Looking good now? Should disappear. And there you go. All set. Great. Thanks, Stephen. Well, here's a view of the KMA for those of you who haven't been here. It's a beautiful building designed by renowned museum architect, Edward Larrabee Barnes. The museum was opened in 1990 with little or no collection. It really began as a community dream. And so one of the challenges since then has been for the museum to establish a collection and an identity. Now, for some reason, Christy, I'm, okay, there we go. I'm just gonna advance the slides this way. As uh, Hillary mentioned, we had this wonderful exchange between the Asheville Art Museum and the KMA. We're lending you our Buford Delaney exhibition in exchange for this fabulous show of Black Mountain College work entitled The Lasting Imprint, which fills two of our entry level galleries. And here's a shot of one of those galleries. It's a show that we've been longing to bring here for a long time. It's great that it's finally here. It's gotten a fabulous reception. And I'm in denial that the show is almost over. Uh, I'm still enjoying it every time I go up there. I'm very envious that you all have such a fabulous collection. One of the things that we did as a young museum was to move away from bringing in these packaged shows from exhibition organizers. And instead we started thinking about what can we do as a museum to capitalize on the region that we're in and what can we do to tell the story of the art that evolved there. And so what we did several years ago uh, was to establish on our third floor, a couple of large galleries devoted to that art history. Higher Ground on the lower right is an historical gallery that runs from roughly 1860 to about 1960. And it tells this, I think really surprisingly rich story of the arts in East Tennessee. And then across the way, you see that story moving into contemporary times where artists living in East Tennessee right now producing cutting edge work are shown in this global context of contemporary art. And so that's really become our core identity. And what we've tried to do since then is find ways of spotlighting themes within those broader narratives. Uh, in our higher ground gallery, two of the key figures are Catherine Wiley and Lloyd Branson. They were artists working between 1880 and about 1920 and they were in touch with the wider art world. They traveled extensively. They brought back all of these uh, ideas of art and collecting and museums to Knoxville and enriched and invigorated that community. But of all the artists in the universe connected to East Tennessee, Buford Delaney is a star apart. And what was frustrating for us is that while the museum had been able to slowly and gradually build this East Tennessee collection, it owned nothing by Buford Delaney. One of the things that we set out to do was to identify opportunities to secure that legacy in Knoxville. And one of the first things we did, and this goes back to my time at the KMA in the mid 1990s, I was able to make connections with the administrator of Buford Delaney's estate. I reached out to him. We developed a partnership that has evolved over the years and has been of great mutual benefit. The Delaney estate had been housed downtown in Knoxville in a second class uh, secure space that really had a lot of problems. And so what we did eventually was the KMA offered to house the Delaney estate in one of its storage facilities. 
And that way we were able to protect the contents and show good faith to the estate administrator that we wanted to be partners with the Delaney estate. In exchange, the estate administrator allowed us to borrow works from the estate and put them on view. Um, but the estate is filled with all kinds of wonderful contents. It's got Buford Delaney's entire library. It has correspondence between Buford Delaney and luminaries such as James Baldwin, Al Hirschfield, Georgia O'Keeffe, Henry Miller. Uh, Buford had amazing connections throughout the arts and cultural worlds. One of the things that we were able to do with the support of our collectors group was to consult with the estate administrator, raise money through our collectors group and make a landmark first purchase of Buford Delaney's art directly from the estate. And we went through and tried to select a cross section of uh, periods in his evolution and different subjects, different media, because as I hope my presentation will show you, uh, he covered tremendous terrain in terms of style and subject matter. And then for this acquisition, we were able to get national coverage. Um, people such as the New York Times calling attention to Buford Delaney's return to the scene after a period where he was largely overlooked, not just in Knoxville, but far and wide. And then one of the things that happened after that was the KMA wanted to trigger a series of events that would lead to Buford Delaney being cherished and, and known by Knoxvillians, whether they were museum goers or not. We wanted to make Buford Delaney a household name in Knoxville. One of the things that our director challenged me with was he basically said, Stephen, we've got this really solid Buford Delaney collection now. We need to put together a scholarly exhibition. Do you have any ideas? And it just so happened at the time, there had been a show put together by a group in France. It was gonna be really expensive for us to bring it to Knoxville. And so I argued that rather than bringing this show to Knoxville, let's develop our own ex exhibition. And one of the things that triggered my interest in making it a Buford Delaney show through the eyes of James Baldwin was the acquisition of this particular pastel that's on the screen right now, Portrait of James Baldwin from 1944. And the way that we were able to acquire it is really unusual. Uh, back when we had no money at all to work with, a dealer in New York had brought to my attention the availability of this pastel. This is probably back around 1992 or 93. When suddenly we're trying to figure out how to put this show together uh, that you all have a portion of now, I was thinking we needed to find works that related to James Baldwin. And so I remembered that pastel. I went back to the dealer and the dealer said, you know, Stephen, that piece was in our gallery on consignment. It went back to the owners a long time ago, but if you want, I can contact them. I'm still in touch with them. So I reached out through her and said, if this piece is still available, we'd be very interested. It turns out that the owners of this pastel in New York were undergoing home renovation. They needed money, so it was perfect. We ended up settling on a price and we acquired what I consider to be the first ever Buford Delaney portrait of his protege, James Baldwin. So that was one key acquisition that put us in a great position. Another key acquisition that almost didn't happen was this pastel from 1950 entitled Yado. And it's a, a artist retreat where both Baldwin and Delaney spent time. And it's one that we saw at auction, it was coming up and we felt like the estimate put us in a decent position to go after it. And we set up the call, we were gonna do a phone bid. We were talking with the head of the auction company. He said, we got you squared away. You'll be hearing from us momentarily. Then the lot came and went, we never got a phone call. And so one of our trustees 
who has a lot of connections in New York, happened to be sitting in the office with us. He got on his phone right away. Long story short, a day or two later, we got a phone call from an agent in New York who was talking to the person who was the successful bidder. And we were able to work out a price and we bought the pastel off of that winning bidder. And it became another part of this James Baldwin, Buford Delaney themed collection that we were building. And then the real landmark acquisition happened in 2018. We went to some of our major stakeholders in Knoxville. We had gone through the Delaney estate and selected a group of additional works that we thought would round out our Delaney collection. And we managed to raise, I think it was about 750 or $800,000 to buy these nine works of art by Buford Delaney from different parts of his career, different media. And we were able to close the deal in February of 2018. Suffice it to say that in talking with the estate administrator now, he says, you guys got an amazing deal. One of those paintings now would be basically selling for the amount that you paid for the whole thing back in 2018. So with these acquisitions, it put us in a position to put together this unique exhibition that looked for the first time at the evolution of Buford Delaney's career in art through the eyes of James Baldwin. And so we called it Buford Delaney and James Baldwin through the unusual door. And here's an installation shot. Some of these works are in your show, others we borrowed from various museums and private collectors all over the country. Um, I wanna give you an overview of the exhibition that you have. It, it's very much in the vein of the show that we had last year, but uh, it, it's really more focused. It really looks along three major areas. First of all, works by Delaney that were inspired by or dedicated to, or that depict James Baldwin, or that emphasize new developments that Baldwin witnessed and wrote about. And then in other cases, it shows, uh, urban scenes, landscapes that relate to, in some way, the Delaney-Baldwin friendship that evolved over a 38-year period. So the first part I'm gonna look at is Buford's earliest days. Here we see some rare photographs of the Delaney family. It was a remarkable family, uh, very creative, very talented. John Samuel, the father, was an uh, itinerant preacher, so in the early years, the family moved around East Tennessee and, and southwestern Virginia on a regular basis. Uh, Buford is there sitting on the bench. You can see he's within the red rectangle. His younger brother, Joe, is in the white shirt at the other end of the bench. He's also a talented painter. And here's the family's home that's no longer standing in East Knoxville, but we were able to put a historic marker there. And early on, the Delaney brothers were noticed as being artistically gifted. And eventually, Buford, as a youth, was brought to the attention of Knoxville's leading professional portrait painter and history painter, Lloyd Branson, who took him under his wing, taught him what it was like to run a studio and to have a painting practice. And one of the things that Delaney's biographer mentions is that Branson gave Delaney a very important early lesson that all paintings should be studies in light. And here is a painting by Lloyd Branson. It's an East Tennessee scene that's in our collection, Going Home at Dusk, that I think embraces that. Uh, and it really shows how Branson had embraced Impressionism increasingly in the last years of his career. And I wanna show you a really rare view that uh, few people have seen. It's this work on the left. It's Buford Delaney's first ever work of art that I've ever seen. It dates back to 1922 when he's still in Knoxville. And I find a striking similarity compositionally between the two paintings. And what I also find striking is that in Buford Delaney's earliest work, light is already a central subject. You see the sun at the very core of this composition. And as we'll see, 
light, reflections, atmospheric effects, all of which we see in this composition feature heavily in his mature work. So Buford leaves Knoxville by 1923. He heads to Boston and settles there. And his earliest work primarily consists of these academic pastels. It shows you his degree of technical skill. On the left is a pastel of his mother, Delia, from 1933. On the right is a pastel of his younger brother, Joe. And in the middle is uh, one of the earliest pieces I've seen, uh, aside from the one I showed you in Knoxville. It's a charcoal study of young man from 1928. New York, he's known for his colorful and thickly painted uh, self-portraits and portraits, as well as urban scenes. He was from, in New York from 1929 to 1953. And then he goes to Paris in 1953 and is active until the mid 1970s. And he's known mostly for his inventive portraits and self-portraits, which become increasingly elaborate and abstract, as well as his abstractions. So we go back to Boston. Buford leaves Knoxville, he's in Boston. What happens that triggers his shift from academic pastel portraits to the work that he's known for. Well, it's his love of museums. He goes to the Gardner Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts, spends time particularly soaking up the lessons of Van Gogh, Monet, Matisse, and Picasso. And so he, he looks to each of them for different things. Monet for his focus on light, Van Gogh for his emotional use of color, Matisse and, Van, and Picasso for their powerful lines and distortion of form. In New York, he falls under the spell of a variety of artists and writers, but they fall under his spell as well. And these are just a few of the people who were part of Buford's constellation of luminary friends and fans. And then here are some of the artists that Buford is looking to. There's some of his contemporaries, but yet even though he's aware of what they're doing, he's striking out in his own in terms of a, a developmental path, a stylistic path. One of the things that was a major influence on him was meeting the young James Baldwin. The two of them forged this ironclad friendship that evolved over a 38 year period Baldwin very much looked to Delaney as his mentor, and the two of them uh, thrived off of one another's uh, intellect and wit. They spent time together in uh, the bars and cafes. They performed musically together. Uh, they were each other's muses. And so going back to that fateful day where the two men first met, it was on the streets of Greenwich Village. It was actually in Buford Delaney's studio at 181 Green Street. I managed to track down what may be the only photograph in existence of that studio. And it's right above where the sedan is in the image at the right. And he was on the top floor. And one of Baldwin's friends, Baldwin was like 15 years old. One of his friends in school said, hey, I know this artist guy, you'd probably like to meet him. Uh, just go up to the third floor, knock on the door, and I think you'll really enjoy it. So Baldwin later wrote about that fateful meeting. And here's the quote. He said, a short brown man came to the door and looked at me. He had the most extraordinary eyes I'd ever seen. When he completed his instant x-ray of my brain, lungs, liver, heart, bowels, and spinal column, he smiled and said, come in and open the door. He opened the door, all right. Lord, I was to hear Buford sing later for many years, open the unusual door. And so he talks about walking into Delaney's world where on the walls were paintings with colors and forms he'd never seen. Uh, on the record player, the phonograph were records he'd never been allowed to hear in his conservative household where his uh, uh, preacher stepfather ruled with an iron hand. And so Buford Delaney's world gave him for the first time the clear impression that uh, a man of color could be a great artist or a great writer. And here are 
two of the earliest Delaney images of Baldwin. On the left is the first one chronologically, but it's not so much a portrait as it is this idyllic study of a youthful figure. Uh, the color scheme is uh, elaborate and inventive and full of energy. Uh, it's almost as if so early in their friendship, less than a year after the two had met, that this shadowy figure implies that Delaney hadn't yet fully come to grips with Baldwin's potential. Whereas on the right, this next portrait of, of Baldwin from 1944, it's a clear, uh, immediately identifiable Baldwin likeness. And Baldwin looks at us directly with confidence. It's as if Baldwin has, in Delaney's eyes, matured and he fully sees this, this powerful individual who would reshape the American landscape in so many ways and shapes. Now, Baldwin always considered himself ugly, physically ugly. Delaney saw him as, as beautiful. And in many of the portraits that we see in Delaney's uh, studio practice, in many cases, he would take great liberties. Uh, however, with this one, I think he does a great job of enhancing the color scheme, but staying fairly true to Baldwin's physical features. One of the things I want to touch on was how Baldwin witnessed key developments and that I, I owe so much to Baldwin and his observations for some of the ideas that drove home the exhibition that we put together. Uh, in terms of the adventurous use of color, we look here at this pastel of Delia Delaney on the left versus the 1944 pastel of James Baldwin. And you can see, I think, a profound change. The colors and the Baldwin likeness become uh, almost iridescent. And it really makes you wonder, was it the lesson of, of Matisse and Picasso? Was that it or was there something more going on? The other thing we see in his early New York period is this pretty dramatic transition from Van Gogh inspired urban scenes with jewel like color to scenes that become fluid and uh, highly patterned and highly abstracted. Only two years apart, but worlds apart stylistically. So what explains some of this? Well, we, again, I looked to Baldwin's words and in so many cases, there were profound things that Baldwin shared. He talks about how early in their friendship, they would walk through Greenwich Village together and would just have conversations or they might say nothing at all. And he said that there was one particular instance that transformed his consciousness. And it was when they were walking along the wet streets of the village, they stopped and Buford basically said, look, and Baldwin looked and didn't see what Buford wanted him to. And Buford said, look again. And Baldwin says, I saw oil in the water in this puddle and the city reflected in the puddle. And for me, this was a revelation. Buford taught me to see and to trust what I saw. And so this oily puddle becomes this reflective surface. It, it shows you something of Delaney's vision, the fact that he was looking in places where other people might not have been looking and finding magical possibilities that he used to transform his artistic practice. So when I look at these works, these early portraits of Baldwin and their color schemes, I have to wonder, was this puddle story and the iridescence that Baldwin saw uh, a factor in De De Delaney's decision to choose the colors and the patterns that he uses in these two early works? Again, we see such a, a dramatic departure in terms of the way he was using pastel only 11 years earlier. Something else that led me down a pretty exciting wormhole was after we acquired this pastel, I noticed this faint inscription in charcoal on the lower right. And it's in Buford's hand. It says to John Arvonio from Buford Delaney, 1944. And I immediately 
tried figuring out who John Arvonio was. And it turns out that Arvonio was a photographer who actually photographed some of Buford Delaney's art for Henry Miller's 1945 uh, publication on Delaney, but he was also an experimental filmmaker. And coincidentally, his best known short film from 1952, Abstract in Concrete, is basically 10 minutes focused on the streets of New York City, looking at watery reflections, colorful watery reflections in the streets. It's almost as if he was aware of Baldwin and Delaney's story. And Arvonio knew not only Delaney, but he knew Baldwin. So the three of them could have been talking about this. And so I keep wondering whether there's a connection here. And if so, how, how intensive is the connection and which direction is the influence going? Because evidently Arvonio started his film by the mid 1940s. He didn't finish it until 1952. So did Delaney see early clips of Arvonio's film and then get inspired to produce abstract scenes like this on the left? Or was Arvonio drawing from Delaney and his puddle story? Again, I think it's just really intriguing and it's a, a, a path of inquiry that uh, no one else has really followed. And so I'm, I just thought it was a lot of fun to examine this and, and the potential implications for re-examining Delaney's work. And so in my mind, when I was putting this show together last year, I was thinking about not only the puddle being a key catalyst for Delaney's development, but this larger interest that Delaney showed in reflective surfaces in his immediate environment. There are sketchbooks that we have that Delaney has written in stained glass Gothic cathedral. He's even made some preliminary sketches that are very angular and pixelated almost. And then in the middle is a pastel sketch of Delaney that's actually a study for stained glass. And so when you look back at some of these early New York scenes from 1945, to me, they give a, a stained glass appearance, these shards of, of glowing, rich color with clear boundaries around each one of them. Uh, so one of the things that, that Delaney does by using reflective surfaces is finding this radiance in the most dreary places. Uh, Baldwin often talked about Delaney coming out of the darkness of East Tennessee and finding the light. And I think that wherever he was, Delaney had this extraordinary ability to find the light. What I'm gonna to touch on later in my talk is the fact that Delaney constantly sought the light, but the one area that he could never illuminate was inside himself. He was plagued by what he considered to be this, this darkness within, these, these voices that tore him down and uh, belittled him. And his art, his artistic practice became a vehicle to battle those voices. I wanted to show you this as well on the subject of reflective surfaces. If we look at this composition Yado, which is part of your show, part of our collection, um, I wanted to show you in the course of my research, what I realized was that when Delaney was at this, this artistic retreat called Yado in New York, the one place he chose to depict was the greenhouse, the greenhouse at Yaddo. And if you're thinking about someone who is focused on light and reflective surfaces, that greenhouse must have seemed like a cathedral to him of artistic potential. And if we look on the right, it's a much later, more descriptive watercolor done by a different artist. I wanted to show you just what kind of liberties Delaney took. The reason why I'm using this artist's watercolor on the right is because the greenhouse was demolished and so we don't have photographs for comparison. And then in terms of the influence of stained glass, when Delaney is uh, working in the mid 1940s to the mid 1950s, you can see scenes like this, where again, you've got these distinct color shapes with dark boundaries that clearly delineate 
each of those geometric shapes. And the colors again are, are high keyed and, and glowing. And then if we look at the time when he goes to Paris, he and Baldwin end up going to Chartres Cathedral together. Baldwin has a reaction that is not so positive. Delaney is enamored with the stained glass windows. And so when I look at this uh, photograph of the sharp window, I can see how Delaney distilled its color scheme and its, its geometry into this image in the center. It's an oil painting from 1954 called Chartres. And then in our collection, which is in your exhibition, is a pastel from 1956, just a couple of years later, untitled Abstract Circles that I think is informed by this interest in stained glass windows and reflections and, and glass color. Now, when Buford moves to Paris in 1953, he's going there largely because Baldwin is already there. Baldwin left New York in the late 1940s, moved to Paris. The two of them corresponded. Delaney goes to Paris and is thinking it's gonna be a visit. Well, he ends up moving there permanently. And when he goes there, after living in the city for a little while, Baldwin and friends notice that Delaney is running through a really rough patch psychologically. Uh, the voices are getting the better of him. And so Baldwin and friends move Delaney out of central Paris into a nice, uh, what's the word? It's a suburb of Paris that is unlike any environment that Delaney has had a studio in. It's surrounded by trees and by nature. It's quiet. It's, it's tranquil, uh, unlike any studio that Delaney has ever had. And I've read the letters of Delaney during that period, which was roughly December 1955 to February 1962. And Delaney regularly writes about turning inside himself, looking within, being more contemplative. But he also writes about uh, looking beyond, looking to nature, sensing its rhythms. And so in addition to his interest in light, he's got this new interest in movement. There's something about uh, witnessing nature that he's aware of, of movement. And so you begin to see circular patterns in his abstract compositions. And one of the things that I wanted to mention at this point is, again, Baldwin articulates what's going on in a way that really sharpens the, the lens on, on Delaney at this particular point. In the upper left, you'll see this Google Earth image I found that shows you just how green this particular space was. The red dot shows you the ground floor where Delaney had his studio. And what Baldwin writes about is how he used to visit Delaney at this studio and they would sit there together and there was a big window that looked out on gardens and trees and that the two of them would sit there looking through this window and that for Delaney, it became this, this conduit through which he gained a vast wealth of artistic uh, uh, impulse and, and ideas, uh, how they would look at it at different times of day. And uh, it was this kind of universe as Baldwin described, moaning and wailing when it rained, black and bitter when it thundered, hesitant and delicate with the first light of morning, and as blue as the blues when the last light of sun departed. So Delaney's compositions during this time give you this feeling that the hard structures, the geometric structures of his urban landscapes have suddenly been broken open and all of their light and color and energy had been released in these spiraling contours of, of color across the page. We see also a lot more watercolor and gouache because it's the medium that lent itself well to the changing colors and changing patterns that he saw outside of this window. And if you look at some of the watercolors and gouaches that are in the exhibition at the Asheville Art Museum, I, I want you to notice that some of them are almost monochromatic and very thin, but most of them are heavily layered and are usually built up from a dark underlayer to a brilliant or lighter top layer. 
In some cases, he's uh, sprinkling powdered pigment into the wet paint, as we see in the lower right. So he's, he's taking a lot of time and, and trying to build up this depth and this movement. And he develops this atmospheric abstract language that stays with him even after he leaves Clamart in early 1962 and moves back to central Paris. We see echoes of Clamart throughout the rest of his career, as in these three canvases that are part of the exhibition. Um, for instance, on the left is a painting that was in our 2020 exhibition. It's a portrait of Ella Fitzgerald from 1968. But when you look at it, her features are almost completely incinerated within this fiery atmospheric brushwork that we see that looks straight out of his Clamart playbook. And when one of his friends asked Delaney why this likeness didn't resemble Ella Fitzgerald, Delaney responds in a way that gives great clues as to his approach to portraiture. He says, I just painted something that was in my mind. So he's not looking necessarily at photographs as much as he's pulling from his feeling about people. Now in 1961, Delaney goes through again a really rough patch. He's traveling off the coast of Greece and he has a near death experience. He basically, the voices get the better of him. He jumps overboard right off the coast of Patras, Greece and he's rescued by a Greek fisherman. And he ends up having a long period of therapy and recovery. Uh, his doctor basically encourages him to get back in the studio and begin painting again. And on the left is a page from a sketchbook that is in the exhibition in the display case with all the archival material. And you can see on the right photographs of Patras Greece and this sketch is dated only six months after the incident occurred. But what we see are, in my mind, uh, pronounced aquatic references that pop up in Delaney's art. Now we saw that earlier when he was back in New York with this early abstraction from 1947, but on the right in the middle are two works from around 1962 that I think clearly show this aquatic sensibility. And then here is another one that again gives you the feeling of, of light reflecting off of uh, rippling waves and water or light that is moving through bodies of water. And I think the, uh, the pattern brushwork is really strikingly similar. And so it's almost as if Delaney has developed these formal pathways into abstraction by looking at glass and stained glass such as we see here, but also through water as well. Um, I wanted to mention a few of the major themes that are in the exhibition. Uh, one of the things that I, I don't think people give Delaney credit for is the breadth of his experimentation when it comes to abstraction. Uh, when I look at his art, I see those ethereal Clamar abstractions where it seems as if it's entirely uh, devoid of, of any substance. It's all pure light and vapor. But you've also got a variety of other abstractions that have so many different ways in which the pigment is applied, uh, so many different um, approaches to layering. Like for instance, if you look at the work on the far right, it's a rare abstraction where he's actually using uh, a scraping approach. He's scraping the pigment across the canvas, which is unusual for him. And then in the work next to it, that yellow, red, and black watercolor and gouache, it's one that's dedicated to Baldwin when the two of them went to Istanbul, Turkey together. What's unusual about it as an abstraction is that Unlike most of Delaney's art that's worked and reworked and massaged into final form, this composition looks as if it's spilled directly out of his mind's eye onto that piece of paper with no change of heart, no uh, modification. It's just seared into this perfect hard-edged form. 
these strange symbols that no one's been able to figure out. And then we have works on the left that again have this calligraphic feel to them. Um, the one on the far left is actually based on a visit to the Tuileries. So after Delaney has this near-death experience, the doctor tells him to get back in the studio. I wanted to mention these two watercolors which are in the show that I think are really striking in terms of their looseness. Delaney basically chooses a couple of watercolor colors and lays them down on flat sheets of paper and allows uh, an excess of water to mingle with the paints and some of his strokes to create these compositions that become ethereal. They look like an undersea scene or potentially like on, on the left, it's like you're looking out into space and seeing a, a supernova. And he's leaving a lot of the final composition to chance, which was unlike him. But again, I think he's somehow reflecting on his experience just a few months earlier off the coast of Greece. And again, we talked about this broad spectrum of abstraction. The work on the left, there are countless layers, there are countless changes to the color scheme. Uh, matter of fact, the, the, the paper that this is painted on is, is black, and then he's worked it toward the light. Again, almost like moving out of darkness toward light. And in terms of portraits, um, we see a dramatic transition going from this early academic profile done in Boston in 1928 of a young man, which is straight out of Lloyd Branson's playbook. And you go all the way to the left to this image of Baldwin that is so much about Baldwin and his inner light and the color that Delaney sensed not just reflecting off of his exterior, but radiating from within him. And then in terms of Delaney's inventive approach to portraiture, I thought I'd pull together these three images. Uh, again, Ella Fitzgerald, it was uh, actually the two images on the outside were in our show last year. The Marian Anderson image, I wish we could have borrowed it, but it was already committed to a Marian Anderson themed exhibition at the National Portrait Gallery. So here you see three portraits. Uh, again, the Ella Fitzgerald doesn't look like her. The Marian Anderson portrait actually is based on a photograph of Marian Anderson that's widely publicized. But Baldwin and Delaney went to see her years earlier. And Delaney made this painting of Marian Anderson in 1965 and dedicated it to Baldwin. The same year Baldwin published a major work and dedicated it to Delaney. And then on the right is a painting entitled Charlie Parker Yardbird that dates from De Delaney's Clamart period that's entirely abstract. And what I see when looking at this is it's almost like Delaney and Baldwin are there at the club watching Charlie Parker play his sax and Delaney goes back to the studio and tries in some way to capture the radiating sound coming from the bell of his saxophone. Um, I wanted to mention some other portraits, self-portraits that are in this exhibition. The upper left is a monoprint that Delaney did of himself that's uh, really intriguing. It's uh, as if his head has been enlarged. It's as if his forehead has sprouted this third eye that sees into this dimension that Baldwin always knew that he was able to see into. The lower left, we see a charcoal with some pastel from 1963, a Delaney looking at himself with a great uh, sobriety. Uh, it's as if he's assessing himself with this frankness that's, uh, I think, really highly tangible. And then on the right, in Delaney's archives, I came across this series of tiny ink sketches that Delaney did probably within a half an hour of himself. And it's as if he's able to capture these different moments, these different aspects of his persona. And seeing them together, I think, is really revealing. And then his final self-portrait, the, the last known self-portrait from 1971, is part of our collection and part of your show. And on the right is a photograph of Delaney from around that time. And notice how his, 
It's the only full length portrait I've ever come across of Delaney. And he's sitting in a way that reminds me of Dark Rapture from 30 years earlier. And he's sitting in a Paris bathhouse. That's the name of the, of the self-portrait, self-portrait in a Paris bathhouse. And what I find interesting is that he's portraying himself as this lithe, youthful figure in this strange illuminated space. If we look at images of bathhouses around the time, you can see that perhaps the inspiration for some of the background ornamentation was the kind of mosaic work that you'd see, the decorative wall tiles in a, a bathhouse. And then if we look at landscapes in the exhibition, you've got this urban scene from the mid 1940s in New York, as well as this rare pure landscape that reminds me very much of Van Gogh in terms of the brushwork and the intensity of color. Um, we're very fortunate to have found within the estate these two Knoxville landscapes from 1969. It's basically his last return visit to his hometown. And you can see how he emphasizes uh, this, this nature that's overcome by uh, lushness and, and movement and vegetation. And it's as if after all the years of living in the city, he rediscovers his hometown in this new way. Now, I, I may have mentioned earlier how Baldwin and Delaney traveled extensively. They went to Turkey, to Spain, back to the United States together. Of course, they were in Paris in the south of France. And these two works in the exhibition relate to Delaney and Baldwin being in Istanbul, Turkey. The one on the right shows a Turkish fishing boat from 1966. The one on the left being, again, this enigmatic composition dedicated to Baldwin. Um, I wanted to show you some of the references that I see in this late self-portrait that's in the exhibition. Delaney had African art in his studio. He was interested in notions of Africa just as Baldwin was. And the two of them were always uh, frustrated about Africa being referred to as the dark continent by Europeans who didn't fully understand it. And so Delaney would often make notes in his sketchbooks to incorporate more uh, African subject matter. And so I think that this self-portrait reflects some of that. But I wanted to point out the image on the right I came across in the estate archives, and it's actually a mirror image of the piece that's in our collection. It was made from this same piece by pressing a piece of paper onto our self-portrait and then pulling it away before the paint was able to dry. Again, showing how even in his 60s, Delaney is experimenting with different media, different techniques. And the same is true for this African figure on the left, which is in the exhibition. And if you go to Swan Auctions in New York City, they have this painting on the right in the current African-American auction. And it's the positive from which this monoprint was pulled. I've actually seen this painting on the right in Swan's offices and I measured it and I took close up images and the pull marks, the dimensions are exact. Again, I wanted to go back to this late self-portrait and this interest in African art. And in the course of my research, I feel like Delaney was looking particularly at Maasai warriors for the inspiration of his attire in this particular scene. But it shows you again, him thinking back and wanting to incorporate more African-American and African subject matter at a time when Baldwin's involvement in the civil rights movement is at its peak. And so uh, Baldwin is in conversation with Delaney about the struggle back in America. He's traveling back and forth and bringing stories from the front lines of the struggle to Delaney. And then the last chapter of the Delaney Baldwin story happens at St. Paul de Vence in the south of France. By 1970, Baldwin, much to Delaney's chagrin, has moved out of central Paris. He relocates in the south of France in this villa 
and Delaney is only able to visit him occasionally. But when he visits, of course, he's treated like a king, as in this photograph showing Delaney, James Baldwin in the green shirt, and James Baldwin's brother David in the white shirt. And while Delaney's there, he produces works such as this and sketchbooks that are very descriptive of the surrounding area and the view from Baldwin's Villa Terrace. Uh, Delaney was very ill at this point. Baldwin and his friends would have to drive Delaney back and forth from Paris to St. Paul de Vence. They would help him set up his easel. But what I find striking is in so many Delaney publications, there's this myth that Delaney goes from being a more uh, representational painter to a more abstract painter. The truth of the matter is his evolution is nothing close to linear. And that in the last few years of his life and his career, he's producing some of the most descriptive work of his entire life. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the things that we were really happy to be able to do was to get permission to lend from the estate a selection of archival items for your exhibition. And I feel as if these add so much to the Delaney Baldwin story. They shed personal light on the two men's relationship. They provide these points of entry into the men's lives that I don't think you get necessarily the same way in looking at the artwork. And there are also great connections between the archival images and the works in the exhibition. For instance, you might even be able to notice there's a preliminary sketch for that Turkish fishing boat painting right there in the middle of the case. So what I'm hoping is that people are going back and forth from the display case to the paintings on view. I wanna just close by mentioning how our Delaney Baldwin exhibition was more than just an exhibition. It was this broad based uh, project that involved multiple organizations and people and it's really energized our community. This is a slate of things that were supposed to happen before COVID derailed things in March and April. At least we were able to get our Delaney Baldwin exhibition launched. We had an opera production of a Delaney Baldwin story. There was a symphony production. There were readings plays, all kinds of things going on across the city before COVID shut things down. And as I mentioned, we were able to establish a permanent historical marker, the first one devoted to the Delaney brothers. Uh, you're looking at Buford's side. If you go around to the other side of the marker, there's a side devoted to Joseph Delaney. And this marker is very close to where their family home once stood. And then because of our efforts, Knoxville's African American Museum and Center, uh, the Beck Center, right next door is one of the Delaney family's historical homes that had fallen into disrepair. Because of all this newfound interest in Buford Delaney and the Delaney family, the Beck Center has raised enough money to transform this home into the Delaney Museum at Beck. And so once things get back to normal, uh, they're gonna resume getting this reconstructed and opened as a major cultural attraction in Knoxville. And during the run of our 2020 exhibition, the University of Tennessee, because of our show, put together this world-class Delaney Baldwin symposium with scholars from all over the world who came here for three days. They viewed the exhibition, they had high level discussions and it was a great time. And you can see our pastel made it onto the banners that were all over town. And then I wanna just close with a piece of unfinished business that has preoccupied my recent weeks and months. The Delaney Estate Archive, basically all, all the artwork is, is sold by the administrator, but the archives are still there. And what I wanna see happen is the archives remain in Knoxville, not get bought by the Getty or the Schomburg Center or the Yale Library, I want them to stay in Knoxville. And right now, not to jinx anything, but the University of Tennessee Special Collections Library is very interested in purchasing the estate. And I've gotten the library and the estate administrator together and they're working on a proposal 
where this may in fact happen in the next few months. So stay tuned for that. But that to me would establish Knoxville as a major center of excellence for Buford Delaney. It would have been something that we've been working on for close to 20, 25 years. So I'm hoping that's what happens. But again, I'm thrilled we're able to share this show with you and your community. And I hope that uh, it gets Buford Delaney on Asheville's uh, map permanently. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak with you tonight. And I will allow Christy to resume control. All right, well, thank you so much um, for sharing all of that incredible information. Y'all have done so much work. There is a beautiful catalog uh, that the KMA puts together. And we do have a few copies of that still available, although they've been selling like hotcakes. Yep, there it is. So um, it's a fabulous catalog, features a lot of the works in the exhibition here at the museum. Um, at this point, uh, we're ready, I think, to take a couple of questions here and there from folks, if anyone has them. I know Christy and I have been pinging them back and forth to each other, but we want to open it up to um, folks here joining us tonight, if anyone has anything. I'll give you a second to think about it. Maybe I'll start it off. Y'all can drop it into the, the um, chat box or be ready to raise your hand after we finish. Um, so my First question for you is inspired by Vera's comment that she left in the uh, comments in the chat box. And that is about this incredible use of yellow that runs throughout um, Delaney's work. Have you come across anything in your research that speaks to the importance or his attraction to using yellow as a color, which I think when you come see the exhibition, even if it's not the, the color that you see first in a work, it somehow just starts to slowly come out at you the more you look at almost everything that he does. Yeah, yellow seems to be uh, his trademark color. In fact, there was a 1998 exhibition that the High Museum in Atlanta organized, and it was entitled View for Delaney, the color yellow. And I think for Delaney, yellow just symbolized this, uh, I guess, luminous atmosphere at its, at its best. Um, and he found all kinds of ways of constructing yellow. And one of the things that I try to encourage people to do is, there is not a Delaney signature yellow. If you look at his yellow abstractions or even areas of yellow within a narrative composition, He's building yellow out of all of these other colors. There's a, a small oil on canvas abstraction that is intensely orange yellow in your show. And if you look at it closely, there are lime greens, there are whites, there are rusty reds. And he has this way of layering color so that it comes together almost like pixels on a digital screen in a way that's more filled with, with luminosity and movement than if he were to simply find a really bright yellow in a tube and wipe it over the canvas as a single hue. I want to mention though, even though so much has been said of Delaney's use of yellow, there's a great story that I always hark back to when it comes to that big red abstraction that's in our show. And the biographer of Delaney, David Leeming, writes that there was one time where Delaney was coming back from New York to visit Knoxville and to spend time at his family home. And his mother, being aware of Buford's love of the color red, puts this new red bedspread on his bed. And evidently, Buford was so excited by the intensity of that red, he didn't get much sleep. So uh, red is up there, man, just a notch below yellow in terms of Buford's level of interest. But I just am hoping people will pay a lot of attention to the nuances within Buford's yellows and all of the layering that goes into it. 
I think it's pretty clear when you walk through the exhibition, whether you're, and you outlined it beautifully in, in your presentation, um, even when you're looking at his figurative or representational work, that um, he is a master of color. I, I mean, there's such a diversity of styles that's in the exhibition. I've had a couple people come to me and say, is this just one artist? Um, and it is, it's amazing, but his color sense is is truly stunning. Um, what I'm glad, you, I'm glad you got that feedback, though, about mm -hmm. people saying, is this all the same artist? Because, as I mentioned, I feel like people in the past have oversimplified his supposed development from representational urban scenes and portraits to abstractions. And it's, it's this circuitous route. It dovetails, and that's part of what I think makes it so fascinating. And I think, you know, the other thing that's important and that, you know, I've heard you talk about is that he is known for these abstraction works, perhaps more broadly at the moment, but that that was not the only thing that he was making at that time in his life. Um, I don't know if you want to touch a little bit more on, on sort of his parallel explorations of both abstraction and, and representation, even later in his life. I think that... that what he did was when he was doing his most abstract work, he was, he was bouncing back and forth between his focus on the effects of color and atmosphere through that window at Clamar, but at the same time, he was looking within, potentially meditating. I mean, if you look at his library, it's filled with uh, books on Eastern philosophy and, and uh, all these suggestions that he had a rich internal life, even though it was is often shadowy and scary that he did look within. And so I'm thinking he's, he's looking out, looking in and finding ways to bring those abstract worlds together on pieces of paper. And again, turning to watercolor, because if you're interested in capturing things that are in motion, mm -hmm. it's a much more forgiving fluid medium. And so at Clamar, that really becomes this genesis of what becomes uh, almost a specialty in watercolor. He, he continues to experiment with oils as well, but watercolor takes on newfound importance once he spends time in front of that window. Um, in terms of his earlier compositions, they're worked and reworked. Uh, if you look at some of the city scenes, the really colorful ones from the mid-1940s in New York, there are probably a quarter inch of paint build up on, on some of those. And so you get the feeling that he's working from a, a base of operation chromatically to a base of operation that is in the heavens. He's building it up somehow and using color to make these profound connections between a terrestrial existence that he was stuck with, but he had this celestial awareness that Baldwin recognized and I think really admired. I kind of want to touch on on that um, sort of witnessing of, of Baldwin of Delaney's career because I think it's such a, a wonderful framework um, for understanding Delaney's work and I've also seen people come in and get really excited to see James Baldwin's name in connection to the exhibition. Um, so we are so fortunate to have these sketchbooks and ephemeral materials that have come from the estate. And there are these beautiful quotes that you pulled out in your presentation tonight that we also have in our, our galleries. And so um, I was wondering, are these words from Baldwin about Delaney, Delaney mostly coming from letters or did he write about Delaney sort of more formally in his, his actual writing practice that was sort of his published side as well. Both. Both. Um, actually, that makes me think, you know, I really, I need, I should have credited James Baldwin as being co-curator of the <laughs> 2020 show and this show, because without his words, without his guidance, I don't know that it would have all fallen into place. It just seemed like once I read those words and saw through Baldwin's eyes what Baldwin was seeing, it, it just is as if I had my blueprint for both exhibitions. Um, there is a, a, an essay, actually a couple of writings of, by Baldwin. It's an actual short essay called On the Painter Buford Delaney that goes into some of this. And there's another 
larger essay that Baldwin writes in one of his collected essays, Anthology, where Buford is mentioned along with several other people. So there are those two, but I found uh, writings and letters that were published, uh, correspondence, for instance, to someone who I want to say was on a Guggenheim grant review panel. And Buford had asked Baldwin to write a letter on his behalf. And in that letter, uh, it's, it's the letter that I think is actually in the display case. He talks about how Buford has persevered over more adversity than anyone else he's known. And he's triumphed in his emergence from the darkness of Tennessee into the light. Um, so there are letters like that. The frustrating thing is that I came across some really early writings of Baldwin's in the Baldwin papers at Yale and at Schomburg that I thought were Baldwin writing in ways that were referencing Delaney and Baldwin walking through the streets of Greenwich Village and seeing puddles and seeing reflections and having these kind of transcendental discussions. The problem is I went to the Baldwin estate and tried to get permission from James Baldwin, I'm sorry, James Baldwin's sister and from Toni Morrison, who's part of the review team. But at the time I was asking permission, Toni Morrison dies. And basically everything is shut down. They don't wanna even entertain any kind of proposals for permission. And so I basically at their request, I promised that I wouldn't publish any of these materials because basically the, the Delaney Baldwin correspondence, a lot of it is under lockdown until the year 2036. And so, <laughs> I'm sure that you know after that and those papers open up, people will revisit our catalog, this show, that story, and there'll be all this new understanding that may make a lot of what we've just talked about tonight feel obsolete or at least like a drop in the bucket. Well, that's something to, I guess, you know, look forward to, but uh, it's important. <laughs> It's so important, though, to, you know, start the work now because that's, that's you know, really our, you know, the, the purpose of museums and archives and, and, and exhibitions is to, to understand things through the lens in which we're living, you know, so. Um, I'm also hoping that because I made good on the promise to the Baldwin estate that perhaps if we go back with a request at a better time, they might be willing to work with us. So I'd like to think that that door may, there may be a crack in that door. I hope so too. Um, and I'm sure it's gonna be an unusual door at that. Because <laughs> I hear the Baldwin estate is even more tangled than the Delaney estate. The oh. Delaney estate, the Delaney estate administrator, he could easily produce a TV miniseries or get Peter Jackson to do a trilogy. I mean, there's so much drama that has gone on behind the scenes with that estate. And I hear the Baldwin estate is that multiplied by three. Uh, well, I'm glad that the KMA is stepping in to make sure that, you know, this legacy is preserved for, you know, our, those of us living in, in Southern Appalachia and for the greater sort of art historical world. Um, so just another question or two here before we wrap up for the evening from our chat box here. Um, Sandy asks if Delaney's um, experience with mental illness was a part of his evolution in color and abstraction. I am sure that that was a gift and a curse all in one. And that as much as it cut deeply into his effectiveness in managing his life and staying out of poverty, it illuminated his studio practice and opened up creative uh, vistas that he saw that others weren't able to see. And if you look at his sketchbooks, which he often used as diaries, there are some where it's as if it's this stream of consciousness writing about this magical world and then suddenly it turns 
It's as if the clouds are pulled in front of the sun and suddenly he's uh, bemoaning hateful voices that he senses around him and how they're tearing him down. And you just get the sense that it was this pendulum swing throughout his life. And the fact that he was able to produce as much amazing inspired work as he did, it's just remarkable perseverance. I mean, the guy was dirt poor most of the time if he got money for sales or got money from patrons and dealers who wanted to support him financially, he would quicker give that to someone he saw on the street who he felt was in more need than he was. That's just the way that he was. Um, but I think throughout his career, uh, as much as his illness tore him down, I think it probably did, yes, like Van Gogh, give him, uh, give him some kind of added sensitivity to his environment that informed his art. Well, um, for our last question, before I hand things back over to Christy for a wrap up, and I, I want to say before I ask this last question, um, that we appreciate so much your time and this incredible work that you've been doing and um, sort of lead into to what I'd like to get at with this last question from the chat box. Um, and that is, um, what was his relationship with his brother, Joseph? Um, just knowing that you are doing this great work with the KMA to honor not only um, Buford, but also Joseph, because I know that the historical marker that you put up honors both of them. So maybe a word about um, his relationship with Joseph and, and well, Joseph's sort of presence in, in Eastern Tennessee. This could be a whole nother conversation, but I'll try, sure. to, I'll, I'll try to keep it somewhat condensed. When I first came to the KMA, one of my first experiences was meeting Joseph Delaney. Wow. Uh, we had a tiny collection. Joe was generous and gave us a couple of his large urban scenes. And so we had these great examples of Joe's art, nothing of Buford's. And I had always been told from others in the art scene locally that Joe and Buford didn't see eye to eye. Um, Joe was a womanizer, Buford was gay. Uh, Joe was committed to figurative art and Buford was doing all these crazy abstract things that Joe didn't approve of. So I was given this fairly bleak picture of their relationship. Um, I need to add though that, you know, Joe was a, a womanizer because when I was meeting him, uh, he wrote his studio address on a napkin. We had a nice chat and then he suddenly looked over my shoulder and just seemed to kind of tune me out. And I realized he was looking at my wife and he was sort of like, can you move aside? Uh, he, he really thought she was hot stuff. Anyway, um, so he, when I was doing my research for this show, the 2020 show, one of the things that I did was I, I came across a bunch of letters in the Yale archives and the Schomburg archives in Harlem between Joe and Buford. And they were so supportive and respectful and loving. Now, it may be that on paper they were going to be good guys and that it wasn't so good when they were together. Um, but I, I, they loved each other. That's the feeling I got. They loved each other. They admired each other, uh, even though they tolerated each other's differences. And another thing I wanted to point out that I came across that I thought was so exciting but also tragic is that when Buford came back to Knoxville in 1969, you know, the two uh, landscapes that we saw that are in the show, the family tried to convince Buford to move back to Knoxville. Joe was there also, he was in town. And there happened to be an independent curator in Knoxville who was hanging out with Joe and Buford. And she proposed a joint exhibition, the Delaney brothers, in Knoxville showing their work together. And from what I've been able to find out, both Joe and Buford were excited about it. And it looked like it was gonna happen. Uh, one of the other things that made it really uh, important for the brothers is that the show was supposed to happen at the McClung Museum. And the McClung family was the family for which their mother worked as a housekeeper. And so they, the brothers, felt like 
how cool would this be to have a show at the museum? You'll be honored artists at the show that's named for the family that where our mother was working as basically a maid. And so there was this excitement, but then once Buford leaves to go back to Paris to get his end of the show up and going, the letters that follow indicate he hit a really rough patch psychologically and just wasn't able to put it together. I mean, his production had dropped off dramatically by that time. And so Joe ends up having his own show. Buford is not a part of it. So long story short, I think they loved each other. I think they respected each other, understood each other's differences. And uh, ultimately I wish that joint show could have happened. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Hillary, and thanks to all of you for joining us tonight virtually. Uh, we'll be sending out an evaluation to collect your feedback on this evening's program, so please watch your email. The museum is currently open to visitors. We're operating at reduced capacity and have a number of COVID-19 safety measures in place. You can learn more about those safety measures as well as our current and upcoming exhibitions, virtual programs, and small group in-person offerings at AshevilleArt.org. And if you enjoyed tonight's program, please consider making a donation to our annual fund or becoming a museum member. Please also mark your calendars for this upcoming In Conversation program. Next up on May the 20th, in conjunction with our current exhibition, Meeting the Moon, artist Terry Beckham tells the story of NASA's artist program, which supported pioneer artists who envisioned the universe long before mankind had reached space and the artists that continued the task after the space age began. This program is posted on our website and more virtual talks and conversations are added to our calendar daily. For more information and to register, visit ashevilleart.org. We hope to see you in the galleries at the Buford Delaney exhibition or some of our other uh, installations here at the museum sometime soon, and at another virtual program through our Museum From Home initiatives. Thank you all for your support. Stay well and have a great rest of your week.